Pinakota, Pinakota Katoa, and welcome. And every time I have an opportunity like this, I start off by thanking people for coming because it means that when I, can, when I go back to Bethlehem, I can talk to the students there uh, about this gathering here at Christchurch because it's so easy for our students to get the impression that they are forgotten about particularly in the last year or so when Ukraine has dominated the international uh, media. And for me to go back and say this group of people at the other end of the earth came together to hear about what's happening in uh, Palestine uh, is a, a, a significant way in which we can help keep hope alive there. So again, thank you very much for being here. The other times I've been here, and I think this is the third or fourth time I've spoken here in uh, Christchurch, I've generally focused on uh, Bethlehem University. But this time uh, I've been asked to elaborate on what the uh, bishop's uh, statement said and, and to provide some sort of context for that. Because generally what I do is the three things that I seek to do in my other presentations. Firstly, awareness raising. After 15 years in Bethlehem, I shouldn't be surprised, but I am continually surprised at the ignorance of people around the world about what is actually happening there. So awareness raising is really an important part of that. The second thing is friend raising. Raising people around the world who will stand in solidarity with, um, with the Palestinian people and, and raise the awareness. I leave here tomorrow. Palestine, I'm gone. Uh, so we need people here in Christchurch, in New Zealand, who are going to continue to raise awareness. And I'm very pleased that throughout New Zealand I come across groups of people who are prepared to do that. So I would encourage you to do that as well. So awareness raising, friend raising, and then the third one. Awareness. Oh, that's right. Uh, fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget that somewhere. Um, and this is an important part of what we need to do because uh, uh, we have about 3,400 students at Bethlehem University and they contribute around about 60% of our operating budget. We have an operating budget of around 15 million and they contribute about 60% of that and then we fundraise uh, for the rest of it. So getting people from outside Palestine um, helping us do that is uh, sort of quite an important part of, of my job as I travel. So I don't want to overemphasize that, but I just want to mention it. <laughs> so what we're doing is uh, looking at Palestine, okay? And there are four things that I want to do tonight. Firstly, why is there a conflict there? Why is the, the Middle East or Israel-Palestine such a... Uh, a difficult place. So I want to provide some sort of context for that. And then I want to look at what is the impact of what has evolved on the Palestinians. And I unashamedly talk about the impact on our students at Bethlehem University because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. And then how do the Palestinians respond to that uh, and, uh, in the, the situation that they find themselves? And then back to you. What is it that New Zealanders can do to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians? Okay, so those are the four things I want to cover um, in the next probably three, maybe four hours. Because <laughs> <laughs> I could spend a whole lot on each one of those. But anyhow, what we're talking about is Israel-Palestine. And this is a small country on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And it is a small country. It's about 10,000 square miles. And to make it a comparison, New Zealand is 103,000 square miles. And if you put it on a map of the same dimensions, it fits in there. It's a very small country. And it's, it's quite easy to go from the top to the bottom in a day. Now, one of the things I think is important to remember is that the Ottoman Empire was in control of that area for some 400 years. And what happened was that the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims lived together 
in Palestine during that time. They worked together, lived together, and the Jews were a very important part of that, um, that whole period. And, and Jews really have been in, in Palestine uh, really for hundreds of, of years. But the important thing is that they were integrated into this complex society where Jews were part of the fabric of the Middle Eastern society. And I think that's the difference that happened or began to happen in 1897. Because what happened in Eastern Europe, and particularly Russia, that the Jews were really, really getting a very, very difficult time, having a very difficult time. And there was an attempt by the Jews during that the middle, latter part of the 19th century to integrate into the European, into the Russian society. And around the uh, 1890s, uh, a group of them became convinced that this wasn't going to work. It was not going to happen that they could integrate and be accepted. So in uh, 1897, uh, Zionism was, uh, uh, Theodore Schultz was uh, established, Zionism, as a way of identifying some place where the Jews could come together. And it's from then on that uh, they looked at Uganda, they looked at South um, Argentina, and then settled on uh, Palestine as the suitable place for this to happen. Uh, one of the things I think it's really important to remember that through the 18th century particularly, the whole uh, issue of colonialism was a very, very strong part of the attitude in Europe. And colonialism, of its very nature, as it expanded around the world, was that Europeans were superior to the, the people that they sort of came across uh, as they expanded the world. Now, the Zionists would argue strongly that they were not colonial, uh, that they were really just returning home that uh, they weren't like the British or the French or the uh, Germans who took over countries that they had no contact with. Their argument was that they, in fact, uh, were returning home to their homeland. And this is uh, the Bishop of Salisbury in 1903 uh, locking into that uh, um, approach from the Zionists, that nothing that has been discovered makes us feel any regret at the suppression of the native Arab, Arab Palestinians by the Israelite civilization. So right from the very beginning, that the, the Palestinians were of no consequence to the, uh, the Zionists. And I think right from um, 1897 onwards, as they progressed with their movement uh, towards uh, uh, Palestine, there was this attitude that, okay, there might be resistance, but if the, the Zionists are strong enough, we can move those people out. And then in 1917, uh, with the end of the First World War, it really was the end of the Ottoman Empire. And as I mentioned, the Jews and Christians and Muslims lived together in Palestine. But in, on the 11th of December, 1917, when General Allenby walked into Jerusalem, that brought to the end uh, the Ottoman Empire. And so what emerged from that was a, a very uh, distraught, I suppose, time for those people in the Middle East. And, and, then, and then the British had the Balfour Declaration in 1917, and this was very clear that what is highlighted there, His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. So it showed a very clear support from the British for the establishment of a Jewish state. But what that is not often or ever uh, referred to is the second part of that, which says, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. That was sort of put aside. It was just the first part that was emphasised. And I think it's important to remember that Edwin Montague, the only Jew in the cabinet at that time, opposed this declaration. And he was the one that got that second part of the sentence included. Because his, his argument was, he was born in Britain. 
He was grew up in Britain. He worked in, that was his homeland. Not some off, far off place that he'd never seen and never wanted to go to. And so he opposed it. So there wasn't a unanimity about the approach of the Zionists towards uh, Israel. But it did show Britain's uh, commitment uh, to, for the uh, Jewish homeland in Palestine. The immediate uh, impact with the League of Nations was that the mandate for Palestine was given to Britain. And when the Balfour Declaration was set up in, uh, was sent in uh, 1917, there were some 650,000 Palestinian Arabs and 60,000 uh, Jews. However, by 2022, uh, there were 660 Arabs and 84, another 24,000 uh, Jews had come to Palestine. And, and with the British mandate, that, uh, that increased. And, said, and then between 1924 and 1929, 82,000 Jews uh, arrived in Palestine. And the Palestinians became very aware that their land was gradually being taken from them. And then in 1933, with the election of Hitler, there was a, a great surge of uh, Jews into Palestine, uh, particularly from Germany. Now, as the number of immigrants increased, so did the opposition from the Palestinian people. And then in 1936 to 38 was what's known as the Arab Revolt, where it was opposition to the British mandate and particularly opposition to the Zionism and the overtaking of Palestinian land. And we won't go into this in detail, but unfortunately, this was brutally suppressed by the British. And some of the stories that arise from this period when the British put down this revolt are quite horrific, really. So, uh, that brings us through to 1938. And then, of course, 1939 and 45 was the Second World War and the Shoah, the uh, Holocaust. And I think out of that, emerged a huge sense of guilt, a huge uh, openness uh, to the Jewish people who had suffered so much in Germany. And so there was a, an openness for them uh, to move to Palestine. And so there was a huge influx of Jews into Palestine uh, between in 1945 and 1946. And then in 1947, Britain, Britain uh, indicated that they were not going to get, keep the mandate. They, they had suffered so much and caused uh, so much suffering uh, during the time of their mandate that they indicated that they weren't going to continue. And so they handed uh, Palestine to the United Nations. And the United Nations, without any consultation whatsoever with the uh, Palestinians, came up with the idea of uh, dividing Palestine. And this is how they decided to do it. <coughs> that the Arab state would be made up of 43% of the land and the Jewish state of 57% of the land. Now, these, this was what was happening to the Palestinians, the people who had been there. And if we have a look at the disappearing Palestine, in 1946, the Palestinians had 90% of the land. And then under the uh, uh, United Nations plan, they were to have 43%. I think uh, you know you could uh, probably draw a parallel with what happened here in New Zealand uh, with the gradual takeover of the Maori land by, by people who had come here. So the division uh, of the land uh, was proposed and then in 1948 uh, the Br Britain departed and there were 650,000 uh, Jews in Palestine at that stage. And then in May the 14th, uh, 1948, there was a pro proclamation of the State of Israel. Uh, Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister, and uh, then um, Harry Truman as the, the, the first, uh, was the first, the uh, United States was the first country to recognise it. Obviously, the Palestinians were not at all happy with this, and so there was a major uh, opposition to it, and it turned into a regional war. And then what happened then was what the Palestinians called the Nakba, the attack on the Palestinians from the Israelis, and uh, some 750 Palestinians were displaced, and many, many villages just uh, destroyed and uh, 
uh, no, uh, you know, were uh, not to be recognised anymore. So this continued, and then this is uh, what Ben Gurion had to say, wrote in his diary. It must be clear that there is no room in the country for both peoples. The only solution is a land of Israel without Arabs. There is no room here for compromise. This is what the first Prime Minister said about the Palestinians. And if you have a look at every Prime Minister since then, including Netanyahu in, J in January, all of them in slightly different ways have the, exactly the same uh, position. And so their long-term objective is to have no Arabs there at all. And then 48 was the Nakba, and then 49 was the Armistice. And the Armistice was a disaster for Palestinians. Okay? Israel took 78% of the land. Jordan took the West Bank of Jordan River. The Egypt took Gaza. And Palestinians received nothing. Okay? So every part of their land was under occupation, either by Israel, by Jordan, or by Egypt. And of course, you know, they were not happy with this at all. And then in 1960, uh, through until 1967, there was opposition to this. And then 1967 was the Six Day War. And that, that was the start of the occupation, the military occupation of the whole of Palestine. And in many ways, that's what's continued up till now. But the military occupation began with the Six Day War. And I think it's important to keep in mind, the result of the Six Day War was a major victory for Israel. Militarily, it was an astounding victory that a little country like uh, 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 Israel was able to gain the Gaza Strip and Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, to take the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, and take the Golden Heights from Syria. Okay? So all of this land here now was under the control of Israel. You know, it, it was an astounding, it did, did it in six days. You know, to take control of that. But the West Bank and the Golan Heights continue to be part of, are under, under Israeli control. So, and then there was continuing opposition from the Palestinians. And then in 1987 to 1990 was the first Intifada. And I think it's important to keep in mind here the Intifada, the, re, the opposition or the rejection or the uprising against Israel began in Betzahor, next door to Bethlehem. And it was a non-violent uh, re reaction to what Israel was doing. Uh, and the first thing they stopped doing was paying taxes. And then a whole lot of other things they refused to do. And I, I don't know whether it's been out here, but there's a famous film shown in Palestine, anyhow, about the cows. The cows, because uh, Palestinians weren't allowed to have animals. But the, this group of Palestinians had these group of, and they keep, kept hiding them from the Israelis so that they could milk them and have their milk and possibly sell their milk or whatever. And it's, it, it's sort of hilarious, but it's sort of at the same time a, a reality check on what the Palestinians were, the suffering and the oppression that they were under. But it, it was soon clear to the, to the Israelis that a military occupation was different to a, a military governing. And so there were, uh, uh, it, it led to the Oslo Agreement because real, Israel realized military victory was not enough. And so in 19, uh, 18, 1993, Israel and the PLO began talking and that led in September 1993 to the Oslo Agreement being signed. There was huge uh, hope among the Palestinians that this last was going to mean that they were going to get some sort of control over their lives. What has become evident in the last, particularly the last 10 years in the, or in the 15 years I've been there, is what a disaster this was. Because uh, it was supposed to be within five years that the final settlement would be arranged. It's still not arranged. And in fact, you know, in the cold hard facts are that really the Palestinian Authority has become the puppet of Israel. And Palestinian Authority is now responsible for keeping Palestinians calm so that they don't interrupt 
are the Israelis, at no expense to the Israelis. Um, so I won't go into the details, but you know, people are re realizing uh, what a mistake that was uh, in 1993. So the disappearing of Palestine continues. This was what was proposed in 1947. This is what happened in 1949, that the Palestinians were left with the green at 29%, and then after Oslo, it came down to less than 10%. And this was 2018, and with the expansion of the settlements, it's even less than that now. And people often ask me, you know, why, why are Palestinians upset? <laughs> well, I think you could draw a parallel with why the Maori is upset as well. And then there are five million Palestinians who are classified as refugees by the United Nations. So, and then in 2000, uh, Sharon took his uh, security people onto the Temple Mount to the around Alaska Mosque, and that led to the Second Intifada. And the Second Intifada was much, much more violent uh, than the First Intifada. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Palestinians, or some of the Palestinians, de developed a pattern of uh, suicide bombings, and I think uh, that was a disastrous decision on their part, but um, anyhow, that's what happened. And then, in 2002, there was the siege of the Church of the Nativity, and increasing in, in our restrictions. Um, what happened was there were a group of Palestinians who were fighting the Israelis uh, up in, um, in uh, the Jala, uh, to the west of Bethlehem, and the, the Israelis uh, had a major, major move to oppress, to take control of them. And the group of men went and took refuge in the Church of the Nativity in, in uh, Bethlehem. And fortunately, the Franciscans who had control of it uh, kept arguing with the Israelis that they had a right to refuge in, in the church. Um, and fortunately, the Israelis recognised that while they were in the church. And if they went outside, the, the, the Israelis had snipers all around. Bethlehem University was uh, invaded. Well, they closed down the whole of, Palace of Bethlehem for 40 days. Uh, they invaded Bethlehem University, slept in the classrooms, caused a lot of damage, and uh, the brothers had a house on the campus, and the brothers were under house arrest. And at one stage, Brother Joe, who was the director of the community, opened the front door, and there was a soldier out in the garden who opened fire, smashed all the glass in the front door. Fortunately, it didn't hit Joe, but uh, we have left three bullet holes in the ceiling just to remind us of, of that sort of that period. In 2005, the war reached uh, Bethlehem. Now, you may be under the impression, and the Israelis have certainly created this impression, that the war has stopped the suicide bombings. You know, it's a great uh, idea, Sharon, to build this war. It started in 2002. It arrived in uh, Bethlehem in 2005, but it's still not complete. Okay? Now, the fact is that uh, in around 2002, the Palestinians realised their suicide bombing uh, uh, campaign was actually turning the whole world against them. And so they decided they would stop doing that. And it just happened to coincide with the start of the war. But uh, to say that one caused the other is just ludicrous. Because even now, you know, there are young men in Palestine, in Bethlehem, whom I won't name, of course, who can get into Jerusalem around the end of the war. Um, if they're caught, there's all sorts of problems for them, but they do it. And the other thing is, there are thousands of Palestinians on the, on the Israeli side of the war, and some of the suicide bombers came from there. So, you know, it's, it's ludicrous to think that the war was for the purpose of preventing the, the, um, the suicide bombing. What it's done is separate the Palestinians in, in the West Bank from the Israelis. So prior to the war going in, there were hundreds probably, probably not thousands, but hundreds of Israelis would come into the markets in, in uh, Bethlehem on a Saturday. And so there would be interaction between uh, the Jews and the, uh, the Palestinians. And, but with the wall, and now there are big signs, for those of you who have been uh, through checkpoints, big red signs forbidding 
uh, Israeli citizens to, to go into uh, Palestine. It's against the law. In 2018 was the declaration of Israel as a Jewish state. Yeah? And this is what uh, Netanyahu said uh, last year in 2019. Israel is not a state of its citizens. It's not a state of its citizens, but it is a Jewish state. Now there are two million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, but they're not Jews. So there's that issue around how, what status do they have in a Jewish state? And then in 2023 this year, is the election of the most right-wing government in the history of uh, Israel. And, um, you know, Netanyahu's uh, thirst for power uh, caused him to bring in the far, far right religious groups into uh, his government. And they have dictated to him uh, what should happen. And, and the two main, the two leaders of the most extreme have demanded uh, ministries. So one is uh, a minister of uh, security in the West Bank. He's known, publicly known, as a violent man, physically violent and certainly uh, verbally violent man. And he's now in charge of the security in the West Bank. And you might, I don't know whether you read, but uh, after the killing of the uh, 11 uh, Palestinians last week, he praised the army for the work that they had done. Mm. And the leader of the other one has said that the, uh, the human rights organisations are an existential threat to Israel. Yeah. So there's that sort of stuff that's, that's part of it. And so the present is that Israel continues to increase and expand settlements and dominate the Palestinians. You know, there are all sorts of issues, all sorts of problems in Israel at present. Financial, social, whatever. This government, the number one, the number one priority for them is the expansion of settlements. You know, and, and this is because of the, the these extreme uh, right-wing uh, parties uh, who are uh, settlers. See, one of the things Sharon did was he encouraged, this was back uh, in the early part of the century, encouraged young people to take over the, the, the hilltops in Palestine and establish outposts, which would become eventually uh, settlements. And now, uh, you know, giving free reign to the settlers, uh, Netanyahu is beholden to them. So just to give a, some sort of context, the population of uh, the Holy Land, the historical Palestine, from the uh, Mediterranean to the Jordan River, a total population of 14 million people. Seven million of those are Jewish Israelis and uh, seven million are Palestinians, roughly. You know, it's about the same number. Of the Palestinians, uh, five million are in the occupied uh, area, uh, the area occupied by Israel, which is in the West Bank, and two million are citizens of Israel. So that's, that's the makeup of the population in the area. So what's the impact on Palestinians? Well, I think the, the many restrictions uh, that uh, the Palestinians suffer, and the most obvious one is ones in movement. The first one are the checkpoints. The barriers are manned by the IDF and our border police. This, now remember, I meant to say before you remember the yellow part, or the blue, what's the yellow or blue part, um, of uh, the West Bank, how small it was within a very small country. Okay? Now this is where the checkpoints are. Now a lot of people think the checkpoints are around the edge, but you know, they're spread right through Palestine, and the reason is it gives Israel a chance to control the Palestinian movement. Like back a um, couple of years before COVID, five, six years back now, there was an incident at Kalandia checkpoint. I, I can't remember, I don't know, remember whether it was somebody, some Palestinian tried to stab a soldier, I, I don't remember. But Israel just closed down uh, Ramallah. Every exit from Ramallah has a checkpoint. So they just closed all the checkpoints and for five days nobody could get in or get out. 
Bethlehem, I think, has four exits. Each one of them has a, a checkpoint. So if they want to close uh, Bethlehem down, they just close the checkpoints. And that's, that's uh, right across uh, um, uh, Palestine, there's those checkpoints, uh, which give uh, the Israelis control of the area. And then there are trenches that dug across, and they're not as common, but they're there. And when you put the trenches and the checkpoints, these are the barriers. And then you have the metal gates, which can be closed, and this is where they are. And when you put those with the trenches and the checkpoints, this is the pattern of restrictions. And then you have the roadblocks, which are just plonked in the middle of the road to prevent uh, movement. And this is where they are. And when you put those with the other pattern, this is the pattern of restrictions of movement that you get. And then there are the earth mounds. You can see these women having to climb over this to get to their vehicles uh, and behind the, the earth mounds. And this is where they are. And then when you put those with the other restrictions we've looked at, this is the pattern that you get. And there's, this is an Israeli-only road. You have to have a yellow number plate on your car to drive on it. Palestinian number plates are green, so no Palestinians can drive on these. And then this fence here, these, this olive grove probably originally came right across, but the road went through straight to the settlement, and uh, so the Israeli farmer can't come across there. And then you get the wall that snakes its way around uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which is uh, 460 miles long. It's still not finished. Uh, and this gives you a sense of uh, the size of it. Uh, and these are some children here. Uh, it gives you, it's twice as high as the Berlin Wall. And this is where this goes. Again, people think it's around the edge, but it, it intrudes into uh, Palestine in a big way. And then when you put all the other pattern uh, restrictions there, this is the pattern you get. Now this, these maps are the United Nations maps from probably 2010, 2011, and this is the, the Israeli settlements at that stage. There are many, many more have expanded. There are over 700 uh, Israeli settlers in, in Palestine now. And then the Israeli military closed areas where Palestinians are not allowed to go. So you can see that it's, it's fairly restrictive in uh, the movement, even within Palestine. We have students from, uh, uh, from uh, Ramallah that come. Uh, they have to come through two checkpoints from Ramallah to get to Bethlehem. Those, most of those come and stay for the, for the week. They get their accommodation in Bethlehem and then go home on the weekends because it's impossible uh, to, uh, uh, to, to do that each day. And then, of course, there's the flying checkpoints, where anywhere uh, the Israelis can just stop traffic and check people's IDs. So altogether, there's 572 barriers uh, to movement, uh, checkpoints and permanent closures. And it's a way in which Israel continues to control the Palestinians. This is one of, the stu of our students uh, from, uh, from Ramallah. If I want to go visit my parents, in Ramallah that it's a city that if it wasn't for the wall it would be half an hour away but because of the wall and the two checkpoints that I have to cross it takes me around an hour and a half. Well going through the checkpoint is, is very tough because you never know what's, what's awaiting you. Sometimes they can stop you, they can just ask for an ID, sometimes they can scream at you or, or make you wait for, for, for maybe half an hour or an hour or they can simply shut the, the checkpoint and you have to go back home. One of the things that Israel has done in recent years is open up uh, opportunities for Palestinians to work in Israel. And the thing that more than irritates me uh, is that most of this work is construction. And what is it constructing? It's constructing settlements on Palestinian land. But because uh, the economy in Palestine is so poor and unemployment is so high, uh, Palestinian men go through into uh, Israel to these jobs and, and can, because the employers in uh, Israel have to pay minimum wage at least, uh, probably twice as much as they would get in, uh, in Palestine. And these are men at, uh, at the main Bethlehem checkpoint, the 300 checkpoint. 
Some of them line up four, half past four in the morning in order to get through the checkpoint and, uh, to be picked up and get to work on time. So living in Jerusalem and having no house here in the West Bank means that I have to come each day from Jerusalem to Bethlehem and that takes a long time and that also means uh, that I have to cross checkpoints which is something really hard for me as a Palestinian because first of all it takes time and second thing it's not an easy situation to stand in, in line to show your ID and uh, have a soldier tell you if you can pass the checkpoint or not. It might be a bit dangerous sometimes because they might think that you want to do something and uh, put you in jail. The biggest challenge I'd say is crossing the checkpoint. Not just crossing the checkpoint, but the checkpoint itself. Because not only is it a hassle to go to the university and then come back every day, it also make, limits my ability to see my friends. So the friends that I make on campus, it's very hard to see them off campus because I can't visit them as often. And then they can't visit me practically at all. He's from uh, Jerusalem, so he has what is called a blue a Jerusalem ID, whereas the people in the West Bank have a green ID. Uh, he can come through the, the wall, I was going to say without any trouble, um, he, he's allowed to come through the wall. The Palestinians with a green ID have to get special permission and uh, often that's not given. Uh, at uh, religious feasts, the Israelis often open up uh, a number of permissions for, for people to go, like during Ramadan, for example, for Palestinian, for Palestinian Muslims to go into Alaska Mosque. But we have had uh, people at uh, Bethlehem University who have applied, uh, say there might be uh, parents and three children asking, very, very rarely do the whole family get uh, permission. You know, two might get or three might get, but it divides the family in that way. Now he's talking about the friends he has in, in, uh, in Palestine who aren't allowed to go through and visit with him and uh, because of the the difficulty of going through checkpoints and the amount of time it takes, he, he doesn't have uh, the, the ability to be able to spend time with them either. Limits the freedom and limits the life. You are merely dead. Limits everything. You, you do not get to choose what you want to do. You are very, very limited, very restricted. You only live once. I'm, I'm a 20-year-old girl. I want to do what I want to do. I want to travel, go to the sea, go to, with my friends to Ramallah, not in two hours. I want to be there in 10 minutes. And I can if there were no checkpoints. But this is the life and this, this is the reality. We have to deal with it. and. Still, we are living, and we will live through this. Oh, determination to live despite the restrictions that they are under. This is a guy I uh, interviewed two days before I left. As a Palestinian, uh, we saw a lot of movements around the world that uh, protected people. One major problem this year I faced is um, losing two of my friends uh, due to the constant threats that happen uh, within the city. It made me wonder every day I wake up to another day of mourning if it's another one of my friends. So we lost a 20-year-old friend and a 21-year-old friend uh, shot and killed by the Israeli military. This is this year, this is in January. And so he wakes up each morning wondering, you know, who am I going to miss today? So in the light of all that, what are the injustices facing Palestinians? Well, firstly, this, uh, I think it's important, uh, Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think, you know, we keep that in mind when we look at the injustices that the Palestinians are suffering. And this one uh, I mentioned before about uh, Netanyahu's comment about it being a Jewish state. But the number one injustice is not being treated as the you know, and I'll come back and talk about this shortly, but I think this is, this is the crux of the issue around uh, what's going to happen in, uh, in Israel and Palestine. And this is January this, this year, last month. The Jewish people have an exclusive right and an unquestionable right to all areas of the land of Israel. The government will promote and develop settlements in all parts of the land of Israel, Galilee, Negev, the Golan, Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria is Palestine. Yeah. The Prime Minister, uh, this just a few weeks ago, highlighting again, linking back to 
to what uh, Ben Gurion had said in 1948. Morally, human beings have the fundamental rights, and no human being should be threatened with transfer out of his or her land, discriminated against because of his or her religion, stripped of her, his or her land, national identity, or culture. Because all of these show that Palestinians are not equal or respectful. And I think uh, that's really part of the Zionist uh, mentality that. Uh, the, the Palestinians are, are going to object to what's being done, but you just have to force them and, and get rid of them. And they're certainly not respected as equals. So, how do Palestinians respond? Well, they respond by resisting, by resisting the restrictions that they face. And, you know, Palestinians are masters of non-violence. They have been resisting the all pervasive violence of a more than 50 year old military occupation every day since it began. More than 50 years of resilience, of silent and stubborn efforts to live a normal life. One of the things that surprises me, continues to, to surprise me, when I see the way in which uh, the Palestinians are treated, particularly uh, when I go through checkpoints and see uh, Palestinian. Uh, particularly older women who, who struggle and are nervous in getting their IDs out. And I, I can remember just a few years back where she was trying to get her ID to this young woman, uh, a soldier, and she dropped it. And the, the woman just screamed at her and, um, and pushed her out of the way and picked it up. And I'm surprised, I suppose, at how restrained the Palestinians are. You know, I'm not sure what I would do if I was treated that way, but it, it seems to me that um, you know the, there are there are Palestinians who re respond violently. I acknowledge that, but uh, you know the restraint that the Palestinians show, I think, is 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 part of this non-violence uh, that, and non-violence is a, a, a practical way of responding because this is research that's done between 1900 and 2006. Non-violent resistance campaigns were nearly twice as likely to achieve full or partial success as their violent counterparts. And I think one of the reasons is that in a non-violent way, people are respecting one another. But if you do it violently, if you overcome people, if you oppress people, then there's going to be pushback, inevitably. There's this environment and atmosphere of uh, resistance, you know. Although we are completely victimized, everything here is victimized by occupation, but it's not in the mentality of the people. I've learned from my brothers, my older sisters, uh, that you should live and you should resist and we cannot be victimized. We are, but you cannot accept it. If you act like it, you will, you will do nothing in your life but sit there, blame occupation and stop living. And you can't. You can't do that. So the, the choices that people make, the choices that the Palestinians are making, the choice to build a school, the choice to go to school or to go to university, the choice to become a doctor or an electrician or a dentist or whatever, to cultivate your ancestral olive grove, all of these are acts of resistance because they are telling the, uh, the Israelis, we are not going, we are staying here. This is our land, and so it's, a, it's an act of resistance. Uh, Professor Mazen Concia, I asked him a few years ago to do a, um, a short uh, video for me uh, for the, uh, we have an international board of regents, and this is just a short clip from him. Everything we do is a form of resistance. So we say to exist is to resist, and I wrote a book about this uh, called Popular Resistance in Palestine. For example, these girls going to school in Bethlehem as such is a form of resistance. Or these girls in Hebron trying to get to their class, the soldier prevents them, and uh, they sit in the street and have their class. Or when we climb walls, or we protest against the walls, or we tear down the walls, these are all forms of nonviolent resistance. At Bethlehem University, of course, we are engaged in this kind of resistance because when our students come to classes, they are engaged in nonviolent resistance. 
because they go through checkpoints. Uh, so we we do an amazing job at Bethlehem University in the form of nonviolent resistance by graduating our students, educating them for the future so that they use their minds instead of using weapons. They use their minds to uh, challenge the occupation. And we have many, many ways at Bethlehem University where we engage in those kinds of nonviolent resistance. But the important thing is never, never give up. And I think um, that Marzen's uh, thing is that uh, to do research, to be accurate in what you're saying, to educate people, and he has a huge uh, in interest in conservation. And he's doing a lot of research for the Palestinian Authority and for others on the damage that's being done to the ecology of, uh, uh, of Palestine through the dumping of uh, industrial waste by, by Israel into Palestine. Uh, a few years back, I gave a presentation to, at Loyola University in Chicago. And before I, uh, I showed this uh, Juliana's uh, comment, I asked them, how many of your students have to think about what this young woman thinks about before they go to university? When I get out of the house at the morning, when I come to the university, I always take the money that I need for the bus in my hand. So I would not need to open my bag while I'm standing beside the checkpoint waiting for my bus so the soldier would not think that I have a weapon and be shot. I didn't think many of their students had to think about that as they were preparing to come to university. So what can Bethlehem University do to help students resist these structures? About half of our students come from East Jerusalem uh, to Bethlehem and most of them come by bus. And when, the bus, when they get on the bus in Jerusalem to come to Bethlehem University, they're not sure what time they're going to get there. They don't know whether the bus could be stopped by one or two, and we've had one case, uh, the same bus stopped by three different groups of Israeli military. Where the students are herded off the bus, they can be interrogated, they can be arrested, they can have a gun put in their face or whatever. And so not every bus does that happen to, but it's always a possibility that they're wondering about. And so when they step onto campus, I want them to know that they are safe. That nobody is going to interrogate them on our campus. Nobody's going to arrest them on our campus. Nobody's going to put a gun in their face on our campus. It is a safe place for them. And, uh, you know, I'm a de La Salle brother. I follow in the footsteps of Jean-Baptiste de La Salle, who started the brothers over 300 years ago. And I've adapted one of the, his central uh, themes. And I talked to our faculty and staff about the importance of them being brothers and sisters to one another and older brothers and sisters to the young people who are entrusted to us. So I want our students to know that these adults that are in, they're in touch with at Bethlehem University are their older brothers and sisters who are really looking out for them. And so what I talk about is that what we are trying to do, in fact, is create a little oasis of peace in the midst of all of this stuff that's going on around them. And with a fair amount of humility, I would say we're doing a pretty good job at that. And when I listen to graduates, when I talk to young students, you know, they talk about what a peaceful place it is. And I think that's that's uh, an important part of this. Um, whenever I reach the university campus, I start feeling safe. The atmosphere that the university offers for us makes us forget about the struggles that we go through every day. Bethlehem University is a very safe atmosphere, very welcoming atmosphere. It helped me actually find myself in a way where I feel like I've become way more confident. I've been, I don't have trouble talking about my opinion and defending my perspective, no matter who it is I'm talking to, no matter how much we differ. That's accurate. Uh, he graduated a few years ago. He was very clear in expressing his opinion. Uh, you know, we had a number of engagements, shall we say, but I, I really admire him and the, and the, the way in which he, he grew as a young man. And Francis says that the Pope Francis said sooner or later, ignoring the existence and the rights of others will erupt in some form of violence, often when least expected. And I think, uh, you know, that, that's certainly what I've seen. 
This uh, young woman was uh, valedictorian uh, four years ago, and uh, I think, you know, I, I should declare myself, I'm unashamedly biased, okay? These are extraordinary young people, and uh, it's uh, such a privilege uh, to be involved with them. Bethlehem University gave me purpose, a purpose of experiencing and exploring a purpose of discovering my own uniqueness and individuality. A bigger purpose of coming here to learn so that I can serve my community, giving back and making the world a better place. A purpose I look forward to continue to fulfill after I graduate. And when things got tough, Bethlehem University gave me hope. It reminded me that despite the hassles, obstacles, and injustice, that I am an individual who is part of that bigger purpose. It also taught me how powerful my education is and how much it matters in the face of the complexity and unpredictability of the situation here. I can say I am much stronger and compassionate, committed, and focused person as a result of being here at Bethlehem University. <laughs> mm. She talked about two things that I just want to mention. Firstly, she talks about hope, and I started off by this. I think uh, one of the people that has influenced me a great deal around this is Vaclav Havel, the Czech leader. And I, uh, what I've come to realize is that hope is not the, the conviction that something is going to turn out better. But it's the certainty that something is worth doing, no matter how it turns out. And for me, what we are doing at Bethlehem University, I think, is worth doing, no matter what the Israelis do, no matter what their final outcome is. It's worth doing. It's worth providing that atmosphere, that environment, the opportunities that we can to allow young people to develop the skills, acquire the knowledge, uh, develop those uh, attitudes and values that's going to help them live as fully as they possibly can. And she also mentioned the value of education. I don't know how many times I've told this story about Alma Tess, but it, it just, every time I tell it, it, it affects me. Alma Tess was from uh, the village, uh, village uh, Waraji over the back of the Jala and his family home was demolished by the Israeli military. And over a period of time, his family and his family friends rebuilt the house. And I was speaking to him shortly after it had been demolished for the second time. And he said, they've taken my house, they've taken my land, they've taken my freedom, but they can't take my education. You know, and I think uh, that sort of resilience, that sort of courage, that sort of determination, uh, I just find incredibly inspiring. This is a young Muslim girl from, uh, from Hebron. All I remember about myself is that I'm not the same girl I was. When I came to Bethlehem University, the whole world around me has painted in one color, my color. My horizons were narrow and shallow. Now that has changed. Bethlehem University opened me to so many different ideas and attitudes. It gave me all I needed to be, who I want to be and more. It has trained my heart on peace. At Bethlehem University, I was turned into a living conscience and now feel so responsible to learn about and improve this world. Above everything else, Bethlehem University taught me what it is to be a human being. So I'm very happy to be a Bethlehem graduate, and I'm so proud of that. So it's clear that violence has not worked to bring peace. In my 15 years there, it just wrapped in what has happened over the last few days, with the 11 Palestinians killed, and then the Palestinians killing six Israeli, uh, Israelis in the synagogue. And this, this is ramping things up, and I heard, I haven't been able to verify this, but I had heard that on Saturday night there were 144 coordinated attacks on Palestinians by settlers. Um, and, and that doesn't surprise me uh, at all. 
But, you know, as a, at Bethlehem University, we were faced with how do we, as an unashamedly Catholic Christian university, respond to this violence? Uh, and it's an ongoing challenge that we have. And I think it's, it's, um, it's really important for me and being there to, uh, to realize I'm an outsider. I'm not a Palestinian. Uh, and I, I have a privileged role in that uh, place. And, and so I know about what uh, Palestinians are going through. I know about what our students experience on the bus. I know about what uh, uh, experience they experience in their village life. But I don't know what it's like for, our, for a, one of our students, for example, to get on the bus in the morning and wondering all the time, is this bus going to be stopped? I don't know what that's like. I don't know what it's like, for example, for uh, a family to watch their house being demolished by the Israeli military. I know about it. I don't know what it feels like. I don't know what it's like for our, our dean of students uh, three years ago, four years ago. Uh, his house was broken into uh, at one o'clock in the morning. He's dragged out of bed, he's beaten up in front of this young uh, family, and uh, uh, he was placed under administrative detention, he was put in jail. He was there for three days, and then he was let go. And the only comment that was made to him we got the wrong guy. I don't know what it's like for a man to feel that. I don't know what it's like for a farmer, for example, who's for two or three years has been planting new olive uh, trees, uh, two or three hundred of them, and going out one morning and find that settlers have come through and cut them all down. I don't know what it's like to be a Palestinian under those conditions. And therefore, I think it's very arrogant of me to try to tell them what they should be. But what I, I, I think I need to do is to be present to their pain, to be present to their suffering, and to touch their suffering with love, reduce that suffering uh, into love. And in order for me to do that, I think it's really important that I come out of a, a, a grounding and a peace that is not dependent on outcomes. I think that the whole approach to peace or to, to hope or anything that's dependent on outcomes is fraught with all sorts of difficulties. And so, you know, I've got to stand in solidarity with them somehow, uh, acknowledge and proclaim my position as a Christian, that I'm opposed to violence, that I think a non-violent approach is, uh, is the importance, but when students come to me, like this guy uh, did uh, before I left, and two of my friends were killed uh, in this last month, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to respond, but I know that it's very easy to drift into revenge and hatred. And I think this is a disaster for the, the movement towards uh, peace. But I think this is a, a statement, or included in a statement, the Catholic bishops in the Holy Land made that Jerusalem, a city of equality and justice, city of peace for its inhabitants and those coming from the equality and justice. I think this is this is where the the, the core of what is going to bring about the the, the peace in uh, in Palestine, and with. All due respects to the bishops and their statements. Uh, I think the two-state solution is not only dead, it's buried, and I think it's a distraction. I think you can argue back and forth about the two-state solution, but unless you come to equality and justice, it's irrelevant. And until you have, uh, you know, when you have equality and justice, you can then think, well, What's, what's a system that's going to enable us to work? But if you don't have equality and justice, it's, you know, with all due respects, it's a waste of time. And I think uh, there's a huge amount of energy wasted on, on that sort of uh, thing, and uh, I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. So, back to you. So what can New Zealanders do? Well, I come from it. 
uh, from Bethlehem University, uh, an unashamedly Catholic Christian university. I think the first thing I'd ask for New Zealanders is to pray and raise awareness. I've, uh, I've talked about this in many places around the world. And when I go back and tell students, you know, there are people in the United States, there are people in England, there are people in New Zealand praying for you. You know, there's a sense we've not forgotten them. You know, and I think this is a, a, a really important way of uh, acknowledging uh, their, their sense of hope that they need. And then supporting uh, Palestinians. I'm not sure why I put financial first, but anyhow. So financially and then morally, for people on pilgrimage to come, say, to Bethlehem University and engage with it. I had a number, or quite a number of pilgrims, particularly from the United States, who wanted to come to this holy place of, uh, of the Holy Land and, and pray and whatever. And then they see they're going to the Holy Sepulchre, they're going to the church in and they're going to Bethlehem. Why are we going to a university? This is a pilgrimage. And many of them, if not most of them, acknowledge after they've been to Bethlehem University that it was the highlight of their trip because it engaged them with real people who are experiencing what it is to be Palestinians. So, you know, to, to support Palestinians, and I've said to many, many Palestinian groups, of many uh, pilgrim groups, it doesn't matter really whether you engage with students, well, it doesn't matter, but it's, if you don't engage with students, the fact that you are standing on our campus that you have made the effort to come to our campus and they see you there shows them that they are not forgotten. And so that's, that's a value, whether they engage or not. Thirdly, I think it's important to lobby the New Zealand, uh, lobby in New Zealand protesting government policies when they are contrary to justice and peace. Now I'm focusing here on Palestine and the injustice that's in, uh, imposed on the Israelis. But Think of Martin Luther King's thing, injustice anywhere. There's a threat to justice everywhere. So even if the, uh, the New Zealand government, its policies have nothing to do with Israel, if they're uh, contrary to justice and peace, then I think we have a responsibility to, to challenge those. And then to encourage the New Zealand government to lobby other countries whose government policies are contrary to justice and peace. And you know to, to get the government to to uh, lobby them, and I think we have to be very 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 careful with the language we use. I think, uh, as I've said, I see a real clear distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. I think anti-Semitism is alive and well around the world. You know, I hear things from various countries about the way the Jews are treated there, and I think. We have to be outspoken about the injustice that they are suffering. But uh, anti-Semitism is not equated with anti-Zionism. And I'm opposed to anti-Zionism, I'm opposed to Zionism because I think it's a racist thing, because I think it's, it's highlighting inequality. And, and so I think we need to be careful there. We have to be careful about uh, our homophobic and Islamophobic languages, because our words create the world we seek to promote. So just be mindful of that. And I think we have to be careful in uh, a careful Bible reading that does not promote fundamentalism. That is literalism of the Bible, particularly about the land. I think that the whole land thing is a very com com complex uh, issue. And I think uh, you know the fact that um, the Jews have been there for so long, a remnant of them have been there right for, for hundreds of years, um, but the difference uh, between that remnant and the uh, Zionism is the remnant was integrated into the uh, local society. What Zionism is, is saying that we are separate, we need to have this country without uh, Palestinians in it. And we need to make active non-violence a way of life, active non-violence in the way in which we speak to one another. With all due respects, um, in coming back to New Zealand, one of the things that has appalled me, I suppose, is the, the really harsh way in which I hear people talking uh, on social media and whatever. I, I, and I, you know, when I left uh, New Zealand 15 years ago, that wasn't the New Zealand I left. 
And I, I just think it's awful that, uh, you know, there's such violence in the language that is being used. And I think, uh, you know, what Pope Francis says, to be a true follower of Jesus to, to today also includes embracing his teaching about nonviolence. And that's, that's not just physical nonviolence. It's nonviolence in our emotional, in our, our language, and the way in which we engage with one another. And some activists advocate boycotting Israel products from the West Bank and divesting from Israeli firms. This is a BDS thing. Some activists advocate that. Other activists promote the awareness of how Israel is, seeks to normalize Israeli presence in occupied territory. This is just how things are. You know, this is normal. Just get used to it. And then to tell the Palestinian, the story, Palestinian story truthfully and accurately. I've challenged a number of Palestinians whom I think have exaggerated enormously some of the things they're saying. And I think this is not helping. We need to do it truthfully and accurately. And at the same time, we need to acknowledge the sorrows faced by all. A few years ago, we hosted at Bethlehem University a gathering of Jewish families and Israeli families uh, and Palestinian families who had lost children as a result of the conflict. The Jewish families as a result of suicide bombing, the Palestinian families as a result of shooting by the Israeli military. It was, I found, incredibly moving to hear these people say, talking to one another about preventing further other families having to go through what they are going through. You know, wanting to prevent that sort of anguish that they are suffering and acknowledging one another's our sorrow and their suffering. And then we need to keep talking about reality. In the last analysis, the reality is that one group of people is dominating another. And this is a human rights violation. And I think in the last analysis, that's what it comes back to. And we need to acknowledge that. What my fellow students and I will want others to know is that we Palestinians still have hope the hope of breaking free and hope of peace. I want them to know that we Palestinians are not what they hear about us on media. I have always thought that nobody out there really cares about us and our situation. However, that thought changed when I entered Bethlehem University and especially when I joined the ambassador program. I have met many foreign people that really showed me that we matter and that somebody out there knows about us, cares about us and prays for us. Meeting such people gave me hope, as it has to other students. Our voice might not be heard, but yours will surely be, and it will definitely make a change. And even a small impact will make a change. So, so please speak up and tell the world what is happening here. So at Bethlehem University, we seek justice and equality so that peace can prevail and people can live their ordinary lives in dignity and freedom. So coming back to where I was earlier, what we are seeking to do with these amazing students is to create an oasis of peace there for them. So what I've tried to do is to provide some context, some historical context for why there's a, a, a conflict there, to look at the impact of that conflict on the Palestinians, particularly our students, to look at how the Palestinians have responded and the way in which they are resisting and then asking you to consider how do you stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And I'd like to end with this. There once was a land called Palestine where Christians, Muslims and Jews lived fine in the 1800s. It was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, a bearded guy founded Zionists for Jews to aspire, a land that becomes their home and safe only for their kind. Then there was World War I that ended when the Allies won and England was like, hey, this beautiful land is totally mine. Till the name was Palestine, even though it was colonized, and a promise for a Zionist state was made by a man that had no right. Then more and more 
are Jews arrived seeking refuge and that's alright until their plan to steal the land was no longer to hide. The year was 1948 when Israel bullied its way into a state. Thousands of Palestinians fled their homes to survive. survive. No right for return, no right for a home, no right to fight for the land that they owned. Israel expanded more and more into an apartheid. Where is your humanity? Where is your respect for dignity? Call it conflict, that's insanity. It's time to change your mind. One day Palestine will be free, so be on the right side of history. You're not anti-Semitic if you stand against war crimes. Don't be brainwashed by the news. Now you can see for yourself the truth. Learn about the story. Story of Palestine.